Hello everyone. Uh, this is Grandmaster Art on Actions, and it's Friday time, and that means this is the time for the weekly bootcamp. Uh, yeah, so hi, chess guy, everybody else who is slowly uh, joining uh, my broadcast. As today's topic, yeah, hi, hello again. Uh, today's topic, I've chosen a quite important topic which you probably have a come across it is the isolated pawn yeah i don't think i've made a topic something about something similar before so this is i think something quite important so what is an isolated pawn right and why do we need to talk about it so for example an isolated pawn might arise in uh, uh, various openings okay maybe perhaps the simplest is, I mean, not the simplest, but one of the many is uh, from the Tarash, for example, like this, here, knight c3, c5, c takes, e takes. Yeah, so let's say at some moment, uh, black plays uh, either it's knight c6 or knight f6, let's say g3, knight f6, here, here, castle, castle, takes, takes. Right. So that is the isolated pawn on d5. And um, that's one of the things uh, which can grant advantages for either side if you know how to properly play it out. Uh, it might seem that some people are actually concerned about getting an isolated pawn because everybody supposedly realizes uh, and understands the rising problems which can arise after getting the isolated pawn. But if, when we think about, about it from the other perspective, essentially an isolated pawn very often is the only central pawn in the center, right? I mean, white doesn't have any central pawns here, while black does. He controls e4 c4 and e4 squares sometimes it can be pushed forward gaining some space advantage so it really depends what kind of pieces and what kind of situation do we have on the board yeah hello again guys uh fionster uh hi alberto and uh i would like to show you some examples and uh sort of uh, analyze them and uh, try to understand the best practices we can try oh thank you checkup yeah uh checkup is uh one of my <laughs> most loyal uh followers so thank you again thank you thank you and uh what we are doing here i just started my stream of um uh, my weekly boot camp i'm trying to explain the uh, powerful side of having to play against an isolated pawn and I hope you learned something new from today so I'll show some practices from some of the world's best players including Anatoly Karpov Karpov has played so many um, instructive games how to use the isolated pawn in terms of how to blockade it and attack it afterwards uh, I'll also show some other games, including mine as well, and we'll get a better understanding. Right. Okay, so I'll just go forward with the first example. Um, yeah, I think I'll choose. I think I'll choose. Uh, let me let me find. Let me try to find a classic. Okay, let's start with the classic. Viktor Korchnoi against Anatoly Karpov. Uh, they played two World Ch Championship matches. This one is from 1981 in Merano. And um, Karpov is going to be playing black. Yeah, again, thank you guys for the raid. <laughs> so Karpov is playing uh, with black. Korchno is white. So the opening, I won't really uh, discuss too much about it. Uh, yeah, bishop g5, like this, like this. You can play it out in many, many ways. e3, c5. Yeah, so black tries to 
at least uh, create some pressure at white center. So this is why he prefers to play c5 as quickly as possible, so that white doesn't grab the center very quickly. And here, Korchnoi voluntarily creates an isolated pawn. I mean, he had other options here as well. There is quite a um, um, good way to play just for peace activity. Play knight takes on d4, play short castle, perhaps uh, queen b3. Oh, thank you, born to range 8 for the sub. That was early. <laughs> thank you. So I'm getting one step closer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah thank you. I'm one step closer to my goal. Appreciate it, really. Hope you like the content. And uh, here, white is just having some little space advantage and um, somehow try to justify he is ahead in development. Yeah, but Korchnoi deliberately went for e takes on d4, and again, it depends really how do you play it out. Uh, when we're looking at this position, white has the only central pawn, black doesn't have it. So, again, typically, like in the previous example, white controls. Uh, the e5 and the c5 square and uh, what is quite important to understand that white did this to organize a potential attack at the king side so for example a typical idea might be for white uh, finish uh, development something like a short castle position either the queen on e2 and bishop d3 and prepare queen e4 try to checkmate on h7 or sometimes bishop d3 bishop b1 is positioned so that the queen can join either uh, queen d3 or queen c2 still with the same ideas to organize attack on the h7 sometimes why does it like this as well a3 bishop a2 bishop b1 that's one idea the second idea is white might use this pawn to push it forward to gain some slightly more space advantage. For example, let's say black plays knight c6. Um, let's say castle. Let's imagine black plays b6. So his idea is very simple. He wants to play bishop b7. He wants to play knight b4. Block this pawn. So quite a viable strategy at the right time might be to play d5. I don't think here it really works because the white bishop is under attack here. But just to illustrate the idea, takes, takes, takes. And if not for this bishop, this pin can be sort of annoying, even if the pawn is on b7. So that's what black has to watch out. And uh, here, what happened in the game? Korchno played short castle. And of course, Karpov is playing, uh, Karpov, uh, is playing with black, and he understands uh, perfectly the rising position. And he starts to simplify the position. So first, he makes sure that white cannot play immediate d4, d5 by causing him some damage. So he plays a quite unorthodox move, knight h5. Uh, the idea is very simple. So black is forcing white to take on e7 so that he can rearrange the knight from c6 to e7 and then proceed b6, bishop b7, try to block this pawn on d5 so that's usually the best strategy um yeah i see your born to range question if you have an isolated pawn you must keep the bishop pair um if you are playing against an isolated pawn i think it's a great idea you start to block it in the beginning you try to block it with a piece i wouldn't really say it's so important to keep the bishop pair so here, let, let's have a look at this. Why actually Karpov played knight h5? The other idea here, I mean, since we are trying to block it, might be to play knight b4, right? Because the idea seems to be very logical. I want to play b6, I want to play bishop b7, I want to play knight e5. But then again, we have to take into account that it gives up the e5 square. Uh, white might proceed with same idea, queen e2, somehow try to probably play a3 bishop d3 bishop b1 queen e4 and still get to this attack on h7 right uh, so karpov decided to play knight h5 takes takes bishop b3 and knight f6 goes back 
And from this moment for White, it's not so easy already to prove where is his attack. Because at any given time, if he's gonna play bishop c2 and queen d3, there is no threat to take on f6 anymore. And second, black at any given time can play g6 and close this diagonal. So all black needs to do is manage either like this, either like this, develop the pieces and try to start to block this pawn. So let's see, let's see how the game progressed. Knight e5. Yeah, apparently b6 is going to be too slow. For example, b6, queen f3 can be annoying. You have no time to play bishop b7. So bishop d7 is more accurate. Here, rook c8. And uh, here, Korchnoi started to misplay the position. Why not? Yeah, it's c chess lifestyle. Why not immediate d5? Let me go back. Instead of bishop b... Yeah, it is possible, but I have a feeling that the rising position is just going to be equal. So, I think white was still thinking about... Yeah, it makes sense. Like I said, there are two types of plans for white. I mean, one type, uh, one plan, the typical plan, is white tries to checkmate you uh, because of uh, this uh, little space advantage try to use this long diagonal and the second is uh, not so often really try to push d5 get rid of the isolated pawn and uh, try to make it somehow work but here specifically i don't think it really works because for example let's say i'm gonna take it takes takes bishop takes and knight of six goes back or maybe even knight of four i think actually knight of six looks more secure and you cannot keep the bishop on this diagonal. So I think in terms of um, White's approach, when we go back, why Korchnoi did this? You have to understand. He wants to win. I mean, he doesn't want to, to play for a draw with White. So here he deliberately created isolated pawn so that he gains some space advantage and uh, he can try to go for an improvised attack at the king side at some point later. He did not take the e takes on d4 just to create a weakness that he can fix at some point later but apparently here maybe he had nothing better to do yeah so perhaps he did not really understand that the pawn on d4 might become really that a big weakness here already for white it's not really that easy to play so i think yeah check up here right no, Chekhov. <laughs> it wasn't Chekhov. <laughs> yeah, Chekhov made so many questions. It was just lifestyle. Yeah, uh, just lifestyle. You're, <laughs> you're right. I mean, um, maybe White had to play d5 and uh, try to escape. Let's see what happened here. So White slightly misplayed the position. Queen e2. Uh, White is still dreaming about this possible attack. Rook c8. Knight e4 is already a step in the wrong direction. So. White insists, I want to make this attack happen. I want to play bishop c2. I want to get rid of this knight. I want to position this uh, battery of the queen and the bishop on the long diagonal. But it's not going to happen because the position simplifies. Wait a second, it got a little dark. Yeah, Because the position simplifies. Yeah, it's, yeah by the way, it's totally great. You ask the questions. I mean, that's what I, why I'm here. And uh, if, you, if something is not clear, for example, for, who was it again, check up who first, or Chiefs Lifestyle, again, I keep mixing up, who first asks ask about Bishop B3, just keep asking, and uh, I'll try to answer everything. Right, so 94, what White did not take into account, that after Bishop C6, he has no time to create any threats, he has no time to play Bishop C2 and threaten with a checkmate, because Queen obviously is under attack. Here, Korchnoi made a big mistake. He took on c6. And seemingly this seems like a good continuation, right? Because uh, he takes the bishop. And uh, the bishop uh, is supposed to be better than the knight. But here specifically, after takes, he realized that after rook takes on c6, black is not going to take with the knight. Because then white solves his problem of the isolated pawn and actually manages to activate the bishop 
takes takes and white should be quite happy about the position i think he's slightly pushing here uh knight takes an f7 you mean uh here no not here i don't think there's at any given moment knight f7 knight f7 is simply bishop takes on e4 knight d8 and rook d8 at least yeah it doesn't look like uh, this is a great sacrifice for, for white Either way, the best option White had here, he had to retreat, probably, let's say, something like um, Queen d3, maybe. And then Black can try to take it over. For example, something like Bishop d5, Bishop c2, try to checkmate, and g6. And we can slowly and slowly improve this position. White cannot show anything, any real compensation for this uh, isolated pawn. And his position is slowly deteriorating. Right. So what happened in the game? Yeah, we are. This is one like uh, uh, one big prologue uh, to what happened before we got to the isolated pawn. So why took it here? Takes. I I don't know really. Did he anticipate that rook c6 is gonna happen? Knight takes on c6. Here, black would have played b takes on c6. And the thing is, this pawn on d4 is more weak than the pawn on c6. Black can more easily organize attack against the pawn on uh, d4, including knight f5 and knight d4 ideas, while for white, this pawn on c6 is going to be more difficult to conquer. So what Kochna did here? He played rook c3. And uh, he in whites... A second again i'll try to fix the light a little yeah sometimes it gets a little dark and very quickly so he tries to fix the problem of the pawn by inviting black to take on c3 so for example it would make almost no sense for us queen d7 rook f to c8 that's that's okay yeah it makes sense although Queen d7 specifically is going to be bishop a4, so you need to be accurate. Maybe queen d6 to be more accurate, not to miss any any pins. But we definitely we don't want to take here. So that's that's what we have to understand. Because after takes takes now this pawn on d4 is protected. While we could try to push against the c3 pawn, I mean why can still push the pawns forward and actually he's enjoying sort of a small center. But still, I mean, this position is good for black. But anyway, we have a real weakness here on d4. So you want to pressure it. So queen d6. White uh, makes a window for the king. And here we go. We are organizing every single piece against the pawn on d4. Rook d1. Rook b6. Try and attack the pawn on b4 square. And it becomes apparent that white has moved into a defensive mode. Yeah, hydrate. Hydrate is already important. Okay. I am prepared. Exchange sacrifice. <laughs> okay. And now rook b4 might be perhaps not the best square. So Karpov builds an improvised Alekhin's gun. What is an Alekhin's gun? We have two rooks in front of the queen, and we are targeting, I mean, on this occasion, this pawn on d4. So here, queen d7, very smart rearranging of the pieces. Here, rook d6, and it becomes apparent that white has absolutely no counterplay. Oh, listen, it got a little dark. I'm going to switch on the light just a second. Oh, that's actually not so good. Sorry about that. I keep always having some issues with the lighting in this room. Okay, I'm going to slightly switch it here so that you can see me better and hope you can hear me just, just fine. Right. Uh, so it becomes apparent that white has no game here. So black is simply targeting the pawn on d4, queen e4. Now again, black offers to trade the queens 
after queen takes on c6 we can simply attack with the knight d5 knight b4 we win the pawn although probably b takes on c6 is fine as well but the same idea to play knight f5 knight d4 and we just win the pawn so eventually white declined knight d5 and finally we managed to block the pawn and now all we have to do now is to pressure this pawn with everything we have got so white would not really endure the pressure he decided that since black can threaten this pawn in so many ways for example he might be thinking about ideas like knight c7 and knight b5 which might force for white to push forward he decided to go in absolutely passive defense bishop d5 rook d5 and now white is suffering because of this pawn on d4 still it's not really so easy to win it just outright here black is threatening to play root x and d4 the second idea is to play e6 c5 and use the spin so this is why Korchnoi played f4 and uh, typically as Nemtsovich would advocate when your opponent uh, no I don't think I don't think b7 is hanging really wait a second why is it so dark here okay uh, so typically with one weakness it's not enough No, no, no. Rook b7 is queen takes on b7. No? Am I missing something? Alberto, what are you saying there? So, one weakness on d4 is not enough. And Karpov was maneuvering his game here and there because you cannot just win this pawn outright. For example, play something like f6, e5 might be a viable plan, but this would weaken the pawn on e6 and open the position too much so that uh, white could try to escape. So he continued to maneuver this game uh, here and there, here and there. And at the right time, he switched from pressuring against the d4 pawn against a direct attack against the weakened king. And uh, quite quickly, uh, Korchnoi collapsed. Yeah, so here he started to play for the checkmate. The isolated pawn already didn't really matter. And finally, white uh, lost the queen. All right. Let me show you another example, and uh, this time is going to be from the game Karpov, again, is going to be playing with black against Gatakamsky. Uh, just a second. Uh, they were playing in 1996 uh, FIDE World Championship knockout match, and also in this game, uh, Kamsky deliberately went for an isolated pawn and uh, Karpov masterfully showed the downside of having such a pawn. Yeah, hi Ala Kazoo. So Karpov is black, Gata Kamsky is white. Yeah, C4 was quite popular line back then, the so-called pawn of variation. C takes and 95. Of course, I mean, black can also take with the e-pawn. Shouldn't be really anything uh, that dangerous. But knight takes on d5 is a very uh, logical approach. Because we want to exchange every single piece and try to, again, block this pawn on d5. So let's see how the game progressed. Takes here, here. And again, if you're talking about from white's perspective. Uh, any single equal piece trade is going to favor black. For example, knight takes on d5, bishop d2, queen d2, queen d5. And it's not clear what actually white gained. So white typically goes for this position to create some attacking chances at the king side. So this is of course why... Uh, white did not take on d5 and again for the same reasons black is not taking on c3 because we would protect this pawn on d4 with the pawn on c3 so neither bishop c3 or knight c3 is an option here so bishop e7 castle castle here 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 queen b6 so black is already starting to pressure the pawn on d4 
Yeah, here for some reason it was slightly risky to take it. Yeah, very, very careful. The pawn on b2 was also quite a risky approach, opening too many files. For example, rook f to b1, I think black would already lose some material big time. And uh, black is very accurately developing the pieces and increasing the pressure against the pawn on d4. Take stakes. Yeah, finally, white goes for this idea that he is trying to check on h7. And it's quite important. In the previous game, uh, Korchna against Karpov, uh, we had a, quite a similar position, but it was included. There was a pawn on h6, and white had the bishop on h4. Uh, typically, having the pawn on h6 is a very risky business, because, for example, let's say if he would have this position, and after queen e4, we would have the pawn on h6, we would not be able to play g6 without suffering material losses after bishop takes on h6. So I think you have to be always extremely careful about your pawn structure at the king side. Knight on d5. Ah, oh, you mean a sack on h7? Let me check it. When the knight was... You mean here? Um, You know, in order for this to happen, this bishop has to be elsewhere. For example, had black played, let's say, castle, castle, and bishop d6. Yeah, then we can think about this. Maybe at some moment. For example, bishop takes, king takes, knight g5. The queen is not targeting the knight. King g8 and queen h5 might be the idea. But still here, there is knight of 6. So knight of 6 both attacks the queen and protects against h7. Yeah, there's the there's the bishop on, on e7, so that didn't really work. Right. Um so what happened in the game? Uh so Kamsky decided to take it on f6 to force the matters. Perhaps he didn't have to. He had a number of uh, other continuations here. He decided to force matters. And here Black starts to rearrange his pieces. So bishop e3 is a mistake. So let's let's imagine now. Uh, where would we want to position our pieces? High metal legal. Where would we want to position our pieces? Typically, we want to create a blockade. We want to create a blockade on d5. And uh, what's easier for us is that white is actually threatening to push d4, d5 himself. The knight on c6 typically doesn't do much, so it's a great idea to start with rearranging knight to d5. Yeah, knight, uh, knight e7, you're right. Yeah, so knight e7, the knight goes to d5, the bishop goes to c6. I think that's a dream scenario. When a black manages to put the bishop on this long diagonal, he's threatening uh, to play knight e5, and the only thing what black has to be quite careful here is watch out for a kingside attack because here white has so many pieces i mean four pieces there might be even h4 h5 ideas and uh, you really have to be careful because essentially you have only two light pieces maybe this bishop is also joining the action and you want to watch it out so knight e5 knight f5 uh yeah so again Knight e5, I think it was rather rather playable, but knight on f5 does the same job. We are targeting the pawn on d4 immediately. So here, 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 and we still manage to block the pawn on d4. This time with the bishop. And knight on f5 is already pressuring the pawn on d4 and sometimes even the bishop on e3. So here, after knight e5, here, yeah, white finally decided to take on a 5. Uh, Fisher's favorite attack. Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe it is uh, possible. I mean, this is a quite a common idea to try to open up the king side by h4, h5 as soon as black has played g6. Yeah, so it's absolutely a normal approach. Uh, bishop takes on f5, it solves the problem of of the uh, black attacking the pawn on d4. But the problem is, 
White is no longer thinking about any attacking ideas for himself. And this still, as oddly it may seem, this still is an isolated pawn. I mean, this pawn doesn't have to be on e6. So let's see how the game progressed. Black is slowly increasing the pressure, starting to play. Uh, yeah, by the way, Karpov was a big master. Uh, probably one of the best in the world, maybe even the best in the world, by making these prophylactic moves. Bishop G7, right? Uh, Black is not even in a hurry. Slowly, gradually improving the pieces. This weakness on d4, which white has, it's not gonna go, not gonna go anywhere. You have a blockade on d5, and as long as the bishop remains on d5, you can you can just slowly and carefully impu improve your position, and then you're gonna organize uh, at the right time the pressure against the d4 pawn. Yeah, this knight d7 gives nothing, and very slowly, very carefully, there is a mounting pressure against the pawn on d4. And again, for example, let's imagine here white would take the bishop on d5, queen d5. It might seem actually that white is okay, right? He has the protected passed pawn, but he has a terrible bishop. This is a weakness, and his pieces are very, very passive very passively positioned. So it might just come to a moment when black is simply conquering this pawn on d4. And the grip, the game uh, was, oh, sorry, I jumped forward. Where did I, sorry about that. Yeah, so the game progressed forward. Black managed to block the pawn and uh, managed to con conquer it uh, afterwards. Yeah, so very, very slowly increasing the pressure. Black is seeking for ways to create a second weakness. So this pawn on uh, d4 is not going anywhere. A white cannot really push d5. So, yeah, essentially black is using the power of the two, two bishops. Okay. Yeah, it's... No, not, not for both sides. I think it's very uncomfortable for white. Yes, because white has no real plan. This pawn on d4 is... Uh, really weak, so it was quite typical for Karpov, I would say. He creates a weakness uh, here, for example, this pawn on d4, and he's not even targeting it. Uh, there was, um, you you probably have seen quite a famous game, Karpov against Unziker, where he played his bishop a7, closed the a-file, and uh, seemingly he started his action, all of his plan to conquer the a-file, but simultaneously he was organizing things at the king's side and the bishop stayed on a7 until the end of the game and here for example black has created for white with the help of white of course uh, this isolated pawn on d4 and he's not even in a hurry to to uh, capture it right here right you can see the last last moves for example uh, you might you might ask what's wrong with bishop e6 rook d5 rook d8 uh, I don't know, try to bring every single piece uh, towards the pawn on d4 and try to capture it. Uh, here Karpov is essentially looking for another weakness. So he is simply imp improving the pieces, uh, trying to create more weaknesses in white's position, activates his own, and at the same time either pressuring the pawn on d4 or looking for the second weakness. And eventually uh, Kamsky collapsed. So, okay, I'm not going to show you yeah, how the game progressed. So, he was simply ignoring the pawn on d4 for quite some time. And in the end, he got victorious because he was having very powerful bishops. And this pawn on d4 did not really matter. Okay, but let me show, let me try to show you a more simple, a more simple approach. I think this, maybe I should have started with this one, actually. Anatoly Karpov against Garrett Kasparov. That's a classic. Um, they play this in, the f in their first World Championship match. Uh, chess lifestyle. Yeah, read your question. Uh, yeah, you know, I did not really want to um, I pay too much attention about that particular position. I was hoping 
uh, to show you some real examples about how you can try to exploit uh, the isolated pawn from your opponent in your favor. Uh, yeah, so maybe that particular game was slightly uh, too advanced. All right, uh, but this one is not. This one is quite clear. <laughs> um, I'm going to switch the board. And uh, this was game... Which game was it? Game 9. Yeah. You might have remembered how it started the match. Karpov against Kasparov. Right? The very first World Championship match in 1984. Uh, the reigning World Champion Anatoly Karpov was playing the challenger Kasparov. And after 9 games, he was crushing the challenger 4-0. And it was a match until six wins so pretty much everybody predicted okay Kasparov is gone I mean it's it's game over so this is the game nine the game nine where uh, Karpov managed to beat the challenger in a very nice uh, positional approach in an isolated pawn game it's quite a famous game actually again we have Tarash which I mentioned before which is one of the lines where black voluntarily uh, gets an isolated pawn just to have uh, some activity in the center castle castle here here yeah so white is not really in a hurry to take on c5 i mean there is this move d takes on c5 right away that's another line for example d takes bishop c5 what was it oh there was this old line Knight a4, bishop, either d6, e7, both moves are possible, and bishop e3. So with the idea is to play rook c1, bishop c5, exchange the dark square bishops, and land the knight on d4. So that is the classical idea in this line. So in the game, what happened? Karfa played bishop g5. A sort of threatening to take on f6 and take on c5, win a pawn. So which forced Kasparov to take on d4, knight e4, h6. And now it's quite an interesting moment. White played bishop g5 with the sole intention for black try to clarify what are you going to do about your c5 pawn. And black decided, okay, I'm going to take it on d4. Here, after c takes on d4, knight d4, black plays h6. We no longer, I mean, we did, not, we did not really have any intention at any given moment just to trade on f6 and just get rid of the bishop so that we perfectly understand the intentions of uh, Karpov. He played bishop g5, threatening to win a pawn and target the second pawn. After c takes, job is done. After h6, the bishop is rerouted to e3 where he is very happy to take the place of the knight. For example, a terrible choice for black would be to take on d4. Take stakes, and there is no longer any friction in the center, so this is just an excellent blockader, typically which can be strengthened by move e to e3. And black just has a weakness on d5, and nothing to show for. There is no attack, no nothing. Queen d4, yeah, maybe queen d4 is also good. Yeah, I mean, why not? Yeah, I think, yeah, queen d4, it's it's a good move. Yeah, maybe it's even better, actually. Yeah, I just wanted to show you this idea that uh, black cannot really take on d4 because he is hoping for white to take on c6 so that he can take with a b-pawn and protect the pawn on d5 this way. So what happened there? Rook e8. And here we go. Here Karpov shows his... Um, excellent understanding of the position. He starts to pressure the pawn on d5. The plan is very simple. He wants to play this. He wants to play this. And pressure this pawn. This forced Kasparov to play knight a5. Knight a5. Here. Um, I don't think knight c4 really gives anything here for black. It was possible. White can even think about either playing bishop f4 right away or bishop c1. Bishop c1 looks a bit passive though. Yeah, with the idea to play b3, bishop b2, rook d1, 
rook c1, e3, and slowly but steadily we are gonna get to this pawn. What happened in the game? Bishop g4 was played, and white reroutes the bishop to d4. So we are not gonna sit around or wait for black to play knight c4. We are happy to trade these pieces because this pawn on d5 is gonna be very weak. Rook c8 makes sense, that's a pin. So bishop d4, black cannot really use it. Here, takes, takes. And now quite an interesting moment arises. White could have played immediately knight d4. And seemingly a mission achieved. But the problem is, it specifically lands under knight e4. And if we are forced to take the pawn, this already is not so great because we also have a weakness on c3 to take care about. I mean, there's also an outpost on c4 for the black knight. So this is something we don't want to do. We want to recapture on c3 with a piece. Here Karpov played a much better move. He played knight e3. d4 is impossible. Um, because of rook d1, what doesn't what doesn't defend? Uh, rook a to d1. Uh, rook d1 is gonna happen anyway. Here, rook d1, I'm not so sure. Uh, okay, there's specifically a pawn under attack, bishop e2. You cannot really attack with the knight because there is still a pin, and uh, knight e3 is solving two problems at the same time we are protecting against bishop takes on e2 that's one uh second is we are protecting against various knight c4 ideas and the third we are preparing rook d1 rook d4 double the rooks and we start to pressure you're welcome the spawn on on d5 yeah bishop e6 was played and you know what's interesting i've um I've seen various opening lines where um, a black gets an isolated pawn and computer doesn't understand. It's quite interesting. For example, you would ask in exchange. No, it's not an exchange. It's it's one of the versions of the uh, French defense. I'm going to show you an example afterwards. Uh, computer thinks it's equal. Because black has an equal development and supposedly no problems, but he has the isolated pawn. So computer doesn't really understand the arising dangers. And I think this is one of the moments where humans are actually superior. We understand that an isolated pawn, if it's blocked, it can be easily targeted later. And it can create quite a lot of headache for the defending side. All right. Rook d1, here, 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 and it becomes apparent that Kasparov's opening is a complete disaster because he was and still is a very active, a very dynamic player. Here, black is forced to sit into passive defense with a very weak pawn on d5, which at the moment is still protected. Let's see how Karpov is increasing the pressure. First, he doubles the rooks, which makes sense. Now, knight takes on d5 already might be a real threat. So, knight c4. Simplify the position. d takes is impossible. Rook is under attack. Take. Here. 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 And rook d4. And I think this is already... Um, one part of the mission complete. White is absolutely dominant. When we look at this position, for example, this is a good knight, this is a bad knight. I mean, what is the difference? I am attacking, this guy is defending. This is a good bishop, this is a bad bishop, because, again, we are attacking, he is defending. Here, black decided to trade queens. 
in general. The stronger side should be quite happy to trade some pieces, but not too much. At least I think so. For example, I don't mind trade queens because it's very difficult for me to imagine in this position if I can win the pawn on d5 with queens on the board. So exchanging queens is really a great strategy. Takes, takes. Uh, black is sacrificing a pawn after knight takes on d5. Takes, 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 takes. Seemingly everything is great, but here specifically black is seeking a counterattack attacking these pawns on b2 and e2. So I think this is quite a bad trade. Anyway, it's quite important to understand here. It's our goal. It's our goal. What, why are we doing all of this? We are blocking the pawn. We are pressuring the pawn. And the big goal, obviously, is try to take it. But again, we have to watch out what kind of activity black will get for it. And the pawn on d4, it's not really going anywhere. So what, what, what happened here? Again, Karpov stayed true to his playing style, h3. I mean, seemingly this move is not even necessary, but this is why Karpov was so famous making these slow prophylactic moves, which very slowly improved his position. Maybe the g4 square might be important at some moment, maybe not, you never know, but still it's nice to have it, not to watch out for any bishop g4 ideas, yeah, h5. Yeah, I don't know why Kasparov played h5. Maybe he was concerned that white is going to push g4. Maybe some ideas, for example, uh, g4. And might be at some moment f4, g5. We get rid of the knight. And then we just take the pawn on d5. So that might have been uh, another idea in white's disposal. Or another idea is to push f5, get rid of the bishop. And again, take this pawn on d5. So we are either adding more attackers to the pawn on d5, or we are removing the defenders. Either side, either way, it works just fine for you. And again, it's quite important to understand this pawn is not going anywhere. It's going to stay there. You don't have to rush by taking it and giving your opponent very active counter chances. So this is why Casper played h5. Again, another prophylactic move. a3, e3, here. Yeah, so I can understand, of course, the impatience of Casper. I think already here, White is thinking about some ideas as f3, g4, and the same idea to play g5. So here, Casper decided to force matters. Rook c4. Yeah, I don't know why uh, Karpov didn't play f3. Maybe because of f3 takes, takes, and rook c4. Yeah, it's very difficult to tell, and we cannot really take, and this bishop is closed, and we are not targeting the pawn on b7. I think so. I mean, I don't know really uh, what was in the head of Karpov, but what happened here? Yeah, here Kasparov finally decided not to wait, he played b5 because he wanted to have this option to play rook takes on d4, rook c4, so that he can recapture with the d pawn, and there is no bishop b7 uh, pawn for white later. And after capture, capture, look at this, Kasparov is still offering to take the pawn on d5, and here suddenly Karpov switched his strategy. He was pushing for the pawn on d5 for the longest time, but he changed the character of the position and suddenly he played rook d4. This is quite a paradoxical move. The reasoning is he is not giving his opponent any active counter chances. For example, I don't know, uh, maybe rook d2, b4, takes, takes, and now seemingly, seemingly black is quite active. He can try to prepare some knight e4 ideas. He can try to push against this uh, b2 pawn. And even if by some miracle, let's say, a white manages to win this pawn on, b on d5, black is going to trade these pawns. 
and essentially four pawns versus three at a king side is just a draw. Uh, why black did not take d-dex and c4? Let me check it. You mean here? Uh, that's a very valid question. I don't know, I, I suppose... Was it really like this? I suppose the idea was to play rook d6, a5 and rook b6. I think so. Actually, yeah, that's that's quite interesting, but I think I already found the the answer to your question. Engine very quickly finds everything. I think this was Karpov's idea and also Kasparov assumed the same that if he plays something like bishop d7 he's yeah, look ah this actually drops something. Yeah, rook f6 and 9d4. But this would be very, very passive defense. The point is here he could have played still 97. Takes, takes, takes. Knight c5. And apparently, somehow, wins a pawn back. Okay, there's even 91. Yeah, so 91, quite a funny tactic. But tell you, I'll tell you honestly, all of this is... Yeah, rook f6, yeah, born to rage, exactly. All of this is absolutely not obvious. And uh, especially when your opponent, typically a mindset of a very strong player, and Kasparov, uh, when your opponent takes root a and c4, you're thinking, wait a second, I mean, this is not supposed to be like this, right? I mean, Karpov takes on c4, probably d, d takes on c4 is impossible. So I quickly check it. d takes on c4, rook d6, Ah, okay, I see. Rook b6, bishop d7 is rook f6. I'm dropping the pawn. Okay, I'm dropping the line. That's how typically it works. Uh, you just don't pay, sometimes, sometimes you just don't pay attention forward that there could have been something that your opponent missed. But this is the typical um, sort of a typical approach that you trust too much to your opponent with, uh, to his decision. Yeah, but d takes on c4, it was a better choice. At least according to the engines. White keeps still some advantage, but nothing 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 that dramatic. Yeah, and here Karpov switched the approach because he already has two weaknesses. This is weakness number one. And these are also very weak pawns. And uh, despite the fact the position is closed here, white can still try to win this position. Yeah, and there was I'm not going to show you every single move how the game progressed. I'm just going to show you the critical last moment which you might recognize. So there was quite a famous end game. Takes takes. 93 here here. And uh, do you recognize this move G takes on H4? Yeah, and IG2 of course. Hi Sleepy Mario. <laughs> yeah, well, IG2 is probably one of the most amazing moves. Yeah, I mean, why does not take the pawn on h4, and why? Because most likely it's gonna be a fortress. I mean, we have a very nice knight. Maybe we can still try to win this somehow, somehow to crash through. But the idea of knight g2 is to open the position, and after h takes, takes. Uh, what was it here? For example, bishop g6. Here 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 the problem is that black can never go for the pawn endgame he is losing for example like this this takes here king g6 f4 f5 and black is losing so that was quite quite an interesting moment okay but we are not going to analyze this in game i'm going to show you more examples of isolated pawns and i think i had even more from karpov the last example from Karpov, I, but I mean in practice, he had many, many more. Yeah, thank you, Mishka. He had many, many more. I mean, Karpov was, and still is, I believe, one of the uh, positional geniuses, one of the most raw talents when it comes in terms to a positional understanding of the position, uh, <laughs> uh, to the positional understanding. And uh, this was the game, again, uh, Anatoly Karpov against Gary Kasparov and I believe this was the second match as you might remember the history 
the first match got postponed after Karpov was leading 4-0 after nine games there was so many draws in a row I don't remember how many draws somehow Karpov managed to win the fifth game I mean six wins is end of the match and uh, Karpov was unable to score anymore and slowly but carefully uh, Kasparov made many draws and then he scored one victory, second victory, third victory and the match got cancelled. So they were rematching in 1985 a year later and this is when, when Kasparov won. But this particular game, Karpov won. You know which game? <laughs> okay, uh, let, let's see if, if, you, if you know for sure. Yeah, so again, I'm not gonna talk too much about this Queen Gambit decline. Yeah, so typically for Kasparov, uh, he is seeking active ways. Uh, he is not going to uh, sit in a passive uh, defense. Uh, he stra stays true to his playing style. D takes. Again, look at this. Yeah, D takes. Uh, White is already eyeing for an isolated pawn. Kasparov offers a pawn sacrifice. He is inviting. I mean, you can, of course, take on a6. I'm going to take with a bishop. I'll have very powerful bishops. And uh, chances to take over. I mean, Karpov didn't do it. He simply played queen d2. Here. 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 And bishop e2. And again. Again, we have an isolated pawn. And... Again, computers don't understand this. I mean, hydrate, yeah, hydrate is important. Computers don't understand. They think it's equal. I have to add, though, that black has the dark square bishop. So he would dream about something like uh, playing knight e6 and try to somehow force for white to take on d4 with the pawn. We want to have on d4 at any given time a piece, and we don't want for black to push d5, d4. We need to block this pawn on d4, and then try to get to this pawn on d5 very slowly, very carefully. Let's see how the game progressed. So queen b6, here, knight e4. Black is offering queen to black, a trade, right? But again, we don't want to trade the weakness on d5. We want to capture it. So queen c2 takes, takes, and bishop e6. So I would imagine from afar, probably black must have felt he has quite a solid position. Because it's quite difficult to imagine how white is going to pressure the pawn on d5. I mean, for example, I can always position the bishop here. I can always double the rooks. But in order to capture it, I need probably, I'm sorry, rearrange the knight. And this opens this bishop. So let's see how the game progressed. Yeah, Karpov is very accurate. Here, here. And this is one of the craziest moments, actually. Listen, I tried to... Increase the lighting a little. It's a typical problem for me. Okay, I think this is better again. Uh, this was one of the paradoxical moments. In and I really love such examples. How um, one of the players completely changes the character of the position. Uh, you might recognize another example was uh, Bobby Fischer against Tigran Petrosian. There was this quite famous game where uh, Fischer played knight takes on d7. Supposedly he took the bad bishop uh, just because he realized his opponent has other weaknesses in this position. And here you can only imagine, I think it was a great shock for black, for Kasparov. Can you guess which move Karpov made here? <laughs> so you know, okay, so you don't say please. A knight f6? No, knight f6 is not possible. Oh, 
this is better, much better. Some sunlight is coming in. Yeah, ninety six. I mean, typically ninety six will be a terrible move, a terrible move because you are aiming for a position where black is. I don't know how you make him to take on d4. You take on d4. You are watching out, obviously, for any counterplay. The queen side, some rook c2, make it not work. And you try to pressure this pawn on d5 at earnest, and you try to win it. Yeah, so that's the classical idea, of course. So perhaps it would make sense here that white would love to trade one pair of rooks so that there is no pressure at the c file. But this is why black played rook c8. He's not allowing this to happen. And this made Karpov change his mind. Yeah, he played knight e6. Yeah. But the point is, why he played knight e6? There is another important factor. This is a very weak long diagonal. If he would remove the queens of the board, the knight e6 would be a truly awful move. Because after knight e6 f takes, we cannot organize any hostilities on the weak white squares because we have no queens on the board right and there's also another slight weakness here on e6 and let's see how karpov queen e6 was playable you think uh, i'm not so sure i mean after queen e6 bishop f3 this pawn is lost and either this pawn or the pawn on d7 i'm not so sure if this is playable here here rook d7 yeah maybe maybe yeah computer says this is playable but f takes on e6 was played yeah maybe queen e6 was more secure but but i mean this pawn on d5 now it's so weak and uh, if black is gonna lose it white is gonna torture black for a long 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 time yeah and anyway i mean casper played f takes on e6 he played here and now white can think about organizing a kingside attack like this we already are thinking about some potential ideas to play it like here okay not immediately but at the right time who knows very slowly very carefully Karpov is not in a rush and I just love this maneuver here 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 and it becomes apparent that black needs to be super super careful Queen g6 is a big threat. White keeps opening the position with various threats to land the queen on this long diagonal at some time. And eventually, Kasparov at some moment collapsed. Okay, so I'm not going to show you again how the game proceeded until the end. But this was an example that it started with an isolated pawn. And at some moment, Karpov just changed his approach and found there is something better yeah yeah i'm glad you like it mishka okay um i'm gonna show you this odd game this very odd game i mentioned to you um bobby fisher against tigran petrosia so let's start with the classics and then i can boast about my own games right Okay, so Bobby Fischer was playing against Tigran Petrosian, um, a candidate's match, which he won five victories, one loss, three draws in 1971. And um, this was game, game seven. Yeah, this was game seven. So Petrosian played the bad line. I mean, today pretty much nobody plays like this. Uh, you do not want to open the center like this very quickly uh, when you are lagging behind development. And here, Fisher correctly senses that he can already think about creating a isolated pawn for black. Very quickly opening the position. Opening the position. Yeah, I don't know why 95 was not played. Maybe... For this reason, that the white plays bishop e4, queen f3, knight c3, and still, probably black is gonna get an isolated pawn on d5 sooner or later. 
So he decided to take with a pawn. And again, it might seem this is a central pawn, right? It's the only central pawn, but still, technically, this is an isolated pawn that white can try to block and attack later. Like this, here, here. So black is already in trouble. Yeah, b4, fixing the weakness on a6. I just wanted to show you this paradoxical moment. f3, very nice maneuver, taking away many squares here, here, and here. Yeah, so this is quite, again, quite a famous moment when uh, white is trying to win the spawn on uh, d5, and he changes the character of the position. So think about in terms of Karpov's knight takes on e6. So a traditional, more traditional approach, uh, I would be thinking about taking this pawn on d5, something like g4, g5, I try to make it work. To eliminate this knight from protecting the pawn on d5. But then again, you have to like watch out for some bishop b5 ideas. Maybe after the trade, this pawn on a2 becomes under attack. Yeah, so here Fisher played, do you know the move? So Fisher played knight takes on d7. Again, the good knight against the bad bishop. But what he realized and what he understood better is that this bishop is so much better than the knight. He hasn't have to watch out for any bishop b5 ideas. And the pawn on a6 is still weak. And he can always increase the pressure against this pawn. Yeah, so that was quite a powerful uh, display from Fisher. The spawn on a6 remained weak for most of the time, and Fisher won quite a nice game in the end. Yeah, I just wanted to show you this example so that you see what I was uh, talking about. Um, I'm going to show you something more simple. It's from my game. Yeah, now I'm done. I've showed all of the classics and um, I could show you something from my games. <laughs> yeah. Again, the theme is, the topic is the isolated pawn. Uh, the French defense with 92 is one of the lines which computer is I think quite clueless. Again, we have a classic. Uh, Black has seemingly a good development, so he can easily play something like knight c6, bishop g4, castle, um, yeah, castle, and seemingly he has nothing to worry about. But still, he is suffering because of this isolated pawn on d5, and we can try to block it. For example, with ideas knight b3 or knight e4, or bishop e3, bishop b4 at the right circumstances. Here. Now imagine yourself. When you're playing this position from black, what would be your strategy? Why did you go for the isolated pawn? Uh, those of you who were in the beginning, you might remember, I think I mentioned, uh, I think I started with Korchnois. Exactly. I mean, you voluntarily go for the isolated pawn to gain some space, to gain the, gain the central squares, e4, c4, right? So you want to keep pieces on the board as many as possible. And you're thinking about a kingside attack. It makes sense. So, for example, either bishop b6 or bishop d6, doesn't matter. And it would make sense that black would try to keep queens on the board, play bishop g4, try to play the same idea, bishop b8, queen d6, and try to get to this pawn on h2. Uh, what is this? What is, what is this friend little doing there? Okay, goodbye. 
Um, yeah, anyway. Uh, where is Vishnu when I need him? Uh, wait a second. Why cannot I see the chat anymore? Ah, like this. Yeah, the, it was a spammer I sending goodbye. Yeah, you don't spam me, please. Yeah, I'm not really that uh, advanced with the with the commands as a as an admin here, so I just ban the guy. So you don't spam here. <laughs> Okay, Sleepy Mario, I'll think about it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I have a couple of mods. Yeah, I have a couple of mods. But, I mean, it's... Uh, the occasions are so few. No, 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 I already closed it. I opened the modding uh, window and I was giving some options. I did not know how to close it. <laughs> yeah, now I closed it. Everything is good. Everything is good. Yeah. Yeah, just let's always keep it civil. And uh, sometimes, yeah, somebody just wanders in. He thinks he's funny, but... <laughs> Whatever. We can always dispose of such guys. Anyway. Uh, I think it makes sense. It, I think it makes sense for Black to keep the Queens. Uh, look at what happened. Right? So Black played Queen e7. Seemingly with it, uh, taken with the idea that after Queen e7, Queen e2 captures. He forces me to take with the Bishop. But I'm already quite happy to take with the King. And the black is simply left with an isolated pawn on d5. There is no longer any attack. And we can very quickly switch the game to pressuring the pawn on d5. So we remove another strong piece. Takes, takes. Bishop g4. I think we want to keep the knight. An ideal position. Yeah, by the way, I think I... I, maybe I should have actually mentioned it earlier than this. I want to get a dream position. My dream position is have a knight on d4 against a bad light square bishop for black. So that's my dream position. So I can block the pawn on d5. I mean positioning knight on d4 against the pawn on d5. Play c3. Position at least one rook on the d file and very slowly and carefully try to get to this pawn on the e5. So if black plays bishop g4, we don't want to allow bishop takes an f3 trade because that's the bad bishop. Even technically it's a bishop, right? I mean, I think I already had another topic when I was uh, uh, discussing the power of the bishops. Uh, this is not the case. This is a bad bishop, and the knight on d4 is going to be is going to feel more powerful than the light square bishop. So here we play knight d4, takes takes, rook e8, and I would like to st uh, stop here for a little moment because I've had these positions a number of times. I think it's quite important to understand that why it is better. What is definitely better. So we don't want, probably, to trade this light square bishop. I mean, for black, to trade his light square bishop. If that is going to happen, uh, for example, he plays bishop h5, bishop g6, I mean, it's not going to be much. We have still a better knight, but the pawn on d5, we still need to target it somehow. So I think it's quite paramount for you to keep this bishop and this bishop on the board. So if he would play something like bishop h5, bishop g6, I would think about c3, bishop b5, bishop a4, bishop b3. So that I can attack this pawn and he is supposed to defend it. So I think that's quite important. Uh, hi, Frappuccino. And in terms of the knights, well, I don't really know. Maybe we can trade them as long as we keep the pawn on d5 and not on d4. Because on d4, I cannot really so easily target it. That is one thing. The second thing is, let's imagine. Oh, by the way, maybe I can ask it yourself. How do you think? So black is now threatening to take rooks. How do you think? What should we do? 
take uh, trade one rook or both rooks? What do you think? Yeah, born to rage. I see, but why? Can you reason why? Why do you think it's one rook? Because I've seen so many times people automatically think if I have an open file, I have to use it, <laughs> right? Because, I mean, I have rook on e3. Why can't I play rook e1? I'm fighting for this file. So there's going to be a trade, and black is also going to position the rookie we are going to trade and what has happened you have trade both rooks yeah that's a very valid point born to range yeah very valid point so here for black it's so much easier to bring the king uh to d6 and that's it i mean if we keep at least one pair of rooks on the board, I mean, ideally, it's probably keep both. Uh, but here in this situation, it was impossible. So we are trading one rook. We are not fighting for the e-file. The e-file is useless. And similarly, like in Fisher's game against Petrosian, he also played f3. We take care of these squares. Again, remember, if black would play bishop h5, again, we want to avoid the trade of the bishops. And we want to position like this, 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 here, here. And this pawn on d4 is going to be uh, going to be feeling quite weak for black. So here, black correctly played bishop d7. Now, I think we already learned something from Karpov, from Karpov's examples. So what Karpov did, he created an isolated pawn. Do you remember, was he trying to attack it immediately? He was not. He was just using this um, um, fact that it's there, it's not going anywhere. And he was trying at the same time to try to create other threats. Yeah, combined threats. That's a very nice, nicely worded. Yeah, combined threats. Yeah, so that that's really, really a great approach. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's 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 that's. Uh, I think what you already said. Born to range. Maybe I did not. Uh, clearly expressed but that's how it is yeah you try to keep the isolated pawn on the color of your bishop otherwise you just cannot target it and you try to keep the isolated pawn also on the color of your opponent's bishop that he is forced to protect it and you are attacking it so what we are doing now yeah we are combining threats and i think it's quite a nice idea to fight for space advantage. So here, g4, idea is maybe not immediately. Think about some g5 ideas. Uh, maybe we are limit limiting these bishops' possibilities, but it's just a fight for space. Because if he would be not careful, we would play king f2, black can play h5 himself. Now he is gonna stop us. He's gonna play h5, g6, bring the king here, and um, as Nimtsovic already told us 100 years ago, one weakness is not enough. We need another. Yeah, by the way, I think I should make a topic about this. Uh, the, the rule about the two weaknesses and show you some classics. Yeah, that might be the idea for uh, one of the future boot camps. Right. So here after g4, h6. Here we're slowly, gradually improving the position. H4. Yeah, so black is concerned about G5. I'm not really sure if I'm, I was thinking about G5. Now the time is we start slowly pressure the pawn on D5. Rook D1. 
here again there's no no need to hurry and now we can rearrange the pieces to target the pawn on d5 right away here yeah g5 black is seeking some active counterplay knight e3 so the knight is targeting the pawn on d5 here otherwise knight c4 is incoming here 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 and there was a long long maneuvering game i tried to create provoke some more weaknesses from my opponent but in the end i was not really able to crash through and i was shuffling the pieces here and there here and there here and there trying to find a way until the end i caught my opponent in a quite a nice trap okay maybe those were not the best moves but the trap was this uh, bishop f5 knight a6 and suddenly bishop e6 quite a paradoxical continuation um how do i know it's a good time you know i'll tell you honestly I don't know about the queen side. Um, maybe I shouldn't have done this. This a3, a4, right? I was trying to outmaneuver my opponent. I was trying to provoke him some weaknesses. He was not doing this. So maybe I should have left my queen side intact. About the king side, let's go back a little. So why pawn goes on f3? We take away squares why pawn goes on g4 we take uh control of some space advantage and we are not allowing for black to do a counter defensive move h5 so this is why we are making the first two moves so h6 here here um h4 i think it i think it makes sense to include h4 as well since we are thinking about g4 g5 one of our ideas might be h4 try to position bishop here g5 takes takes bishop g2 and f4 that might be one of the possibilities here are we are uh, driving this knight away from uh, a square which is protecting the pawn on d5 so this is the reason why i played uh h4 i mean another possibility might have been something like h3 and f4 but this gives up the e4 square so i just didn't see how else to pr proceed um, f3 g4 makes sense to me h4 makes sense to me and uh, yeah black played uh, g5 not to miss any f4 timing at the right time for example something like this here here i might just have at the right time f4 and this pawn is probably lost f4 f5 king f3 or bishop e3 bishop f3 this pawn should be lost so this is why black played g5 I hope at least I I partly yeah I hope at least I partly explained about the king side about the queen side I'm not sure I mean ideally I want to keep those pawns intact I want to keep a to b to c3 because that's the ideal position but I have to also watch out from knight c4 ideas and I don't want to trade the bishop for the knight I'll still be slightly better, but it's not enough. And that's the reason why I played b3, because I realized my opponent won't have any time uh, to push against the c3 pawn. And I'm still trying sort of outmaneuver him, like from here, like from here. But still, what you have to understand, it's not enough. I mean, it's not enough, because he, he has only one weakness. And I'm like trying to provoke provoke my opponent into making something a middle into making a mistake and forcing my opponent going into time trouble and pressure and pressure and pressure until he cracks but still he has quite a solid position he is solidly worse but i mean sometimes it's just not enough so you are trying to make your opponent to make mistake so to, yeah like this so I'm about this a3 a4 like i said i'm not really so sure i did provoke him some weaknesses but at some moment i realized that he is super solid i'm not getting through so i was moving here and there here and there shuffling pieces here and there 
And that's why I realized that I need to have more possibilities here. I was thinking about ideas to push b4. Here I realized that he is thinking about bishop b5 himself, and this is why I played a4. Yeah. Not really the best, but that's that's how I played it out. I think I'm quite happy the, the way I treated with uh the king side, the queen side, the pawn on a2 should have should have stayed, I think so. But then again, I did not see how to progress forward. Yeah, so I caught him in a quite a nice trap here, bishop e6. So he cannot take with the rook, the pawn is under attack, he took with the pawn, and suddenly there is no stopping of knight d4 and knight c6. This rook is trapped. So that's how I won the game. Right. Um, I think I got more. Yeah, for example like this. This also was quite a nice game. Um and show it to you as well I uh, <laughs> yeah thank you I play this game against a Swedish grandmaster Rolf Akeson and um, I was with white I had just created the um, isolate pawn on d5 but here the classical approach just doesn't work I mean it's not really so easy first for me to block Second is try to try to capture it somehow. So what I try to do, I just play normal game. I try to create some extra weaknesses. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. <laughs> that that's at least the goal. So I try to create some extra weaknesses in uh, Black's camp. I try to pressure this pawn on d5 and watch out that he is not trading the pawn sometime in the process. So, pressuring the pawn, pay, playing active moves, a couple of pieces I don't mind to trade. Yeah, here was bishop c1, a little paradoxical move, because I want to protect the pawn on b2, so I felt like bishop takes on d6 capture is not giving me anything. Uh, another committal move. I'm sort of threatening with an improvised kingside attack. I might play at the right time queen f1, queen h3. So the game is quite uh, quite complex. Yeah, although, I mean, he could have played d4 at some time. Yeah. And I end up some bishop g6 ideas. I end up exchanging even more pieces. A lot of maneuvering and finally I yet again activate my pieces and seek more targets at the queen side. Yeah, that's another weakness on a6. The position opens, the bishop gets a very nice outpost. The position is slowly opening, queen gets a new line and I finally penetrate through. So it starts with an isolated pawn, but for example the starting position uh, this, yeah, th I think this was the starting position. It's quite difficult to crash through. Black is super solid. I I won't even say I have the advantage. I mean, I just have the isolated pawn. And computer typically says it's it's nothing, but still, this is something that you can uh, you can use. Uh, like I said, why typically the person who goes for the isolated pawn. He goes for this to organize some active play against your king or go for a very um, easy development. If he has none of this, he is suffering because of this isolated pawn and you are just either blocking it or attacking it. I think I had even more examples. Um... Yeah, this I showed. Okay, I can very quickly show this game. It's not really a classic uh, capturing of the or blocking the isolated pawn, but it's going to be similar. I played this game last year against 
a young talent from United States. And this is the line where I invested quite a lot of uh, time and analysis. I call it the Baltic variation in the um, in the Sicilian Paulson E6 G3 uh, is a move which I really love. So D5 is one of the main moves. Takes takes D4 and again. Uh, in the last example, play D4. Yeah, he, he could have. I mean. Yeah, maybe that wasn't really a great example. He could have at some moment, but the position would open. I mean, in that position, I I still uh, not I did not only have the isolated pawn on d5, which I was trying to pressure pressure. I also had two bishops. So, for example, if he would have played d4 at one moment, there was one moment I even mentioned this. This would open the position, increase the power of my bishops. And at that moment, he had a knight on c4. Uh, that would weaken that knight's position as well. He could have played. Yeah, I don't argue. It was about equal. So he did not play it because he felt that it's going to increase the strength of my bishops. And he did not play it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you. So here, uh, here, this is the line where white almost automatically gets an isolated pawn on d5. Because c4 is just uh, just bad. Yeah, I mean, it jumps under. I mean, bishop g2, castle b3. White is just enjoying um, quite a nice lead in uh, development. So the best moves here is knight of 6. Here, here. I like this. And again, black is enjoying quite a free development. But he has an isolated pawn on d5. And comparing uh, with some closed French, we could have this position with the bishop on e2, for example. Maybe again, I'll show you. I think uh, one of the previous examples was quite similar. For example, like this. Knight d2, here, here. Let's say like this. Takes, 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 takes. Here, 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 here. Something like this. Pretty sure this is some theory. I don't remember about exact word in the moves, but something like this. So what is trying again to capitalize on this weakness? Uh, ideally, he would love to trade the bishops here, but black is never going to do it. Right? So I think white plays something like bishop g5, bishop h4, black plays bishop g4, keeps the queens on the board and tries to be very active. But still, this is an isolated pawn. What now I think you can see the position, and for black it's easier to organize a counterattack with bishop g4. What we what we just had is I hope you can see the difference. So the bishop is on g2, it's already targeting the pawn on d5, and bishop g4. I mean there is no there is no bishop d6 bishop b8 and queen d6 there's just no checkmate idea there's nothing because we have a very solid setup at the king side so this is slightly something different and again the plan ideally is i would love to take this pawn on d5 try to block it but still we can concentrate on something else and this weakness for black is going to feel what he played here here that's an, a different isolated pawn structure here here and b4 so the idea is to push b5 get rid of the defender and just capture the pawn which you can also use with bishop b2 and for example there was one line i already don't remember quite a paradoxical one so black plays bishop f5 and white is even allowing him to play d3 because after c, t c takes a bishop or queen d3, doesn't matter. Takes, takes. The isolated pawn is gone. But what is left is a much better piece pl placement for white. We will have a very powerful bishop on the long diagonal. Knight e5 is going to be a big threat. And black is going to be suffering of these weak pawns at the queen side. Even if black did play d3, solve the problem of this pawn on d4. 
it doesn't solve other problems yeah and the game uh, the game progressed something like this here yeah so he exchanged this knight being concerned i'm i'm threatening to to take this pawn right and again typically like in carpas fashion we are having this weakness on d4 it's nice to have it but we are not pressuring it but try like sleepy mario said try to compare threats yeah so we are playing active taking active diagonals here 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 so there you go we have a blockade on d3 this pawn is blocked and we have very powerful bishops uh, again wrong diagonals i have a feeling but and we can focus on something else so again we are creating other threats and everything started with having this isolated pawn yeah i think i missed some questions there um Oh, hi, Ranga Tankful. I didn't see, I didn't see see you there. And uh, okay, I think that was it. I mean, there's one more example, but it's ah, it was played by Karpov in a blindfold game, <laughs> so I'm not gonna show you that. And idea again was trying to. Uh, exploit black's isolated pawn and this isolated pawn it it arises in many lines <laughs> yeah now really check up i mean there there are some uh, i mean there used to be now there's not there was a very popular uh blindfold tournament in monte carlo the world's elite they used to play there for many years yeah it was quite quite an event and the part of the program was they were playing blindfold games yeah, the top elite between each other <laughs> yeah so for example uh the tarash i mentioned is one line which quite automatically leads to isolated pawn i could even take it here right away and that's an isolated pawn. okay that's technic technically not so good because of d4 but let's say knight of three knight of six um, you you name it either g3 bishop g2 or bishop g5 e3 white takes at some time on c5 and black is left with an isolated pawn uh, another opening is for example c4 yeah c4 e5 what was it g3 c6 according to boris avroch one of the um one of the most popular setups against uh, this uh, neo english whatever it's called and here white goes for d4 e takes although there is e4 as well queen d4 d5 what was it bishop here i don't already remember exact orders order the moves here takes takes yeah again a classic yeah so we create for our opponent um an isolated pawn which we try to push it uh Huzman against Aronian yeah I did not find the game I, I was looking for some isolated pawn games uh, I, <laughs> I did not see this uh, game I'm, I mean there are many many games of course yeah I just realized I have I can try to find it for you if you want Huzman against Aronian right which year is it they probably played probably I know the game and just let me let me try to find it yeah they played a couple of games there 2010 okay I, I think I see it let's see what was here do I recognize it yeah of course that's a classic again one, one of those um lines of king, queen's gambit declined ragozin a typical ragozin where the bishop goes to b4 and again and again the idea is yeah how did the game end okay aronian won but you know what this is um 
Uh, this is slightly different topic. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Uh, how to use? Yeah, this is a different topic. Maybe I can, I can prepare this for the next time. Uh, today's topic was how to exploit the isolated pawn in your opponent's camp. For the next time, I could prepare for you some examples how to use the advantage of the isolated pawn because I did not mention it today, right? I mean, I'm showing some ideas, but mentioning that uh, the opponent is trying to attack. There are two main reasons why he is voluntarily going for the isolated pawns is go for the attack or get a free development and space advantage. That's one of those uh, uh, ideas. <laughs> yeah, many, many topics. Yeah, many topics. If I have something prepared for that, it's easier for me. If I have nothing prepared for that, it's more difficult for me. I, I'm, I'll need to prepare something for it. Yeah, I don't think I have any top. I, I, I don't think I have any material prepared how to use the isolated pawn in terms of you are having the isolated pawn and and, and uh, how to attack it. But I'm gonna prepare. Don't worry about it. Yeah, since I'm a chess coach, I mean, I should I should have it anyway. <laughs> so it's uh, yeah. So anyway, what was the game here? Yeah, black is very active. Yeah. And this is what I uh, mentioned, that black is enjoying uh, space advantage. And uh, black, I mean, sorry, white. White would have loved to have this bishop on d4, not on e1. So clearly something is not great for white. Yeah, d4... Yeah, that's a nasty, nasty threat there. No, I don't think I've seen this game, to be honest. But this idea to play d4, it's a classic, of course. To open open the king side, and the king is left. Uh, king is left alone. A black has very powerful knights and the queen, which is serving as a bishop. And blacks, I mean, white pieces are feeling sort of clumsy there. Yeah, that's, that's a nice um, Oh, thank you, Gorilla, for the raid. Appreciate it. Uh, try to remember who are, who is a Gorilla? Grigory Oparin, right? Yeah, I think I remember uh, seeing your channel some time ago. Appreciate it. So, what we are doing here, uh, I'm about to finish actually already. Uh, I'm doing my bootcamp, organizing a bootcamp every week, every Friday, and doing some educational stuff. So today we are um, uh, having a look at isolated pawns, how to play against isolated pawns. For example, your opponent has an isolated pawn and how to play it out and use it to your advantage. And I already was giving uh, an advice from my dear chat. <laughs> That I should try to do the same also from the attacker's uh, point of perspective. Uh, that how to properly attack when you're having the isolated pawn. Yeah, this actually I saw already some materials uh, available on the web. So that would be easier to prepare, actually. Right. So thank you guys again for coming over. And uh, yeah, you managed to catch me in the last act probably. Yeah. So anyway, guys, uh, any any final any final questions? Perhaps something perhaps wasn't clear. Uh, I was showing some examples from Karpov, and I think Karpov is a great study material. He is really a wonderful positional player, probably the best in the world. Maybe Carlson is better. I don't know, but uh, his positional understanding was amazing. Um, are you still there? Suddenly everyone went quiet. Yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, of course you're welcome. Yeah, thank you again for the for the uh, sub, Born to Range. I hope you're going to stay around. And uh, I'm still looking for my sub goal. Okay, it's technically two days in a row, but I'll try to reach it. No, no big deal if I'm going to miss the deadline. I just said it myself. And uh, after I'm going to reach it, I would like to organize this um, 
um, special event um, simul against my subs <laughs> thank you thank you please tell your friends as well and um, after that we're definitely organize some sub games as well I already talked with <laughs> well, maybe I'll extend it yeah I, I already talked with Yevgeny Miroshnichenko he has agreed that after the sub uh, I mean after the simul with the subs I think the next event I could organize is the sub games so that's sort of semi-official already he has agreed he is ready to par participate and we could join the forces together and make something very special out of this hi bastard yeah anyway uh it was fun and uh i think my next stream will be on sunday i'll try to organize this arena uh as promised i think all of you i hope so at least that most of you heard that i'm planning to do my first ever um arena from my chess club at chess.com here's the link if you can join them you can still join it uh we are gonna do it arena 60 minutes and the idea was to do three minutes with no increment and just to have some fun and of course i'm gonna stream everything um everything uh how i'm playing and how are the other members of the club playing so should be fun and there's gonna be i don't know if i already announced there's probably gonna be a secret prize <laughs> you can try to guess what it is for the winner right uh yeah so i'm i'm finished sort of here so thank you again that you are here um do you think we should do a raid i don't know jacob typically loves the raids yeah i know we just had a raid from Agrila Grigory Oparin. Sure, okay. Let me check who is there. Let me check who is there. Maybe there's somebody very nice, very nice person who we could raid. Who we could raid? Somebody. Hashtag chess. What? What is that? What are they doing? Yes. <laughs> Granny grudge match. Um, what is that? On the Mayas. Oh, no, no, no. No Valorant. Ah, by the way, um, I don't think I've ever read the Doffer Spiel before because they're doing the. Analysis from the Offerspiel okay, Invitational so Tournament in, uh, in Norway. Mariches? Who is Mariches? Who is Mariches? Who is Mariches? I don't see any yes, Mariches there. Just go running. Let me, let me uh, check it. Yeah. I think I actually have one fan, rookie 7, and then this should be 7. Mariches. Yeah, if I move it to B4, the downside is I'm no longer attacking the D pawn. And we could rather to e7 okay. threatens to put more pressure on the d pawn okay guys um uh, thank you that you are here today again let's do a quick raid hope you are gonna have a great friday evening at least for me it's uh, evening approached the uh, evening is approaching slowly and uh see you on sunday arena have a great day see you later bye bye